welcome to Security Analysis. I am Uday Bhaskar. This week, we are continuing our focus on Afghanistan. And the specific subject is the implications of the US withdrawal, the exit of the last US military personnel from Kabul on August 31st. And what is the likely impact of that particular policy decision? at different levels. To discuss this, I am very glad to welcome and introduce Mr. Dov Zakheim. Mr. Zakheim is currently a senior advisor at the CSIS, which is a very important and highly respected think tank in Washington, DC. And prior to that, he's had a very illustrious career graph, both in corporate America as also in the government. He's been the controller for the Department of Defense in the Bush administration. And the reason why I thought that he would be particularly relevant for our discussion today is that one, he has a very deep water table on many aspects related to the US Defense Department. And more recently, of course, he's a prolific writer, but I saw something very instructive for me where in one of his comments, he spoke about the audit that he had conducted as far as the US fiscal investment in Afghanistan was concerned, which is roughly $2 trillion as per the estimates put out by Harvard amongst other institutions. So I thought Mr. Zakheim could talk about all these issues in the course of our chat. Mr. Dov Zakheim, welcome to Security Analysis. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. My first question or the you know, area I thought that we could perhaps discuss is, the US has withdrawn from Afghanistan after 20 years. And in that particular, I would say 24 hours, there was a lot of consternation globally, and I'm sure within the US, at what seemed like a very, I'm using a word that I've seen repeatedly in the US media, a messy exit. And lots of people have asked the same question saying that, could this have been done better? So would you like to talk about these two things? One is, of course, the exit, because it is so dominant in our consciousness now, but also about the deployment, because I personally think that there were a lot of, I would say, takeaways which were positive when you look at the 20 years of the US-led global war on terror. But over to you, if you could just address this as broadly or as appropriately as you deem fit. No? Sure. Well, thank you very much. Um, the exit was very messy. It was chaotic. And it didn't have to be that way at all. The reason I say that is that whatever you think about the wisdom of withdrawing all the troops, and personally, I don't think we should have. We were down to a very small number. They were providing backbone to the Afghan forces, which had problems that I'll talk to in a bit, but they were giving them backbone. We made, as I see it, two fundamental mistakes. The first was as soon as the president announced that he was delaying the withdrawal, as you recall, there was a deal made a year ago, a little more than a year ago, uh, in February of 2020. And that was a Trump watch, President and Trump. That was on Trump's watch. And frankly, if you look closely at that deal, it was a terrible deal. They, the Taliban didn't promise very much. The government of Afghanistan was excluded, and we committed to releasing 5,000 troops, which oh, by the 5,000 prisoners, which became Taliban troops again. We uh, committed to getting out, of course. They committed, the Taliban committed, to uh, working to create a kind of coalition government. And of course, they lied about that. And Mr. Biden could have said, look, they've lied. We're not getting out. But let's leave that aside for a moment. Once he says that we're leaving four months later than originally planned, that is when they should have begun planning the exodus so that every, not only every American, and not only every American and NATO and allied uh, military got out, but every single Afghan that had committed to us should, be, should get out. 
yes, that it was terrific that they got 110 or so thousand or so people out, but there are still thousands more left behind. Now, why did they say that they couldn't do that? Because Ashraf Ghani, who, by the way, has been a friend of mine for more than 20 years, asked the president not to do something like that because it would be too public and it would diminish Afghan trust in the government. The only problem was having negotiated an agreement with Taliban without the government already, it had no trust, number one. Number two, everybody knew for at least a decade how corrupt the whole system was. Morale was terrible. We know that. We know that troops weren't being fed. They weren't being given ammunition. Money was being siphoned off. To the richer people had their buildings in Dubai and all that. So you had that problem. You had the question of the government's credibility. It basically had very little control over the whole country. So Biden could have ignored that plea, but he didn't. The second huge mistake was that we left Bagram first instead of last. I've been to Bagram I've, multiple times. Bagram has two runways, 10,000 foot runways each. Could take big aircraft. Hamid Karzai International Airport has one runway. Right. Much more space at Bagram. And people say, well, you know, they would have had to travel some uh, 35 to 40 miles to get there from Kabul. Well, first of all, there were a lot of people outside Kabul. Yep, yep. Second of all, people even inside Kabul had trouble getting to the Karzai airport. So we could have tried to get them to, to Bagram. Again, if it would have been done systematically, if we had used Bagram, we wouldn't have had the chaos we've had. You, the, look, this is a 20-year problem. I would argue it's not a 20-year issue, it's a 16-year issue. Why do I say that? Because when I left the Pentagon in 2004, we had still an Afghanistan that had accepted 2 million refugees back, that was building up small businesses, that the Taliban was only just beginning to get its act together again, and Al-Qaeda was nowhere to be found. Over the years, and particularly because we made the mistake, and I believe it was a serious mistake, of going to war with Iraq, Absolutely. we took our, what we say, our eye off the Afghan ball. In other words, to use one of your cricket terms, if you're the batsman and the bowler bowls to you, but you're looking behind, you get hit in the back of the head. <laughs> that's a good one. And, and that's what happened here. I was put in charge. I, look, I was in charge of the budget, as you very nicely said. I've written about policy and other issues. But my job was the budget. Yet I was put in charge of all civilian activities in Afghanistan. Why? Because the focus of all the other senior leaders was on Iraq, and they needed somebody to look after Afghanistan. That tells you something about the focus, about the lack of attention to Afghanistan. Had we given it all our attention, I don't think we would have been where we are today. I think that's absolutely right, Doug. This is something, let me just add to what you're saying as a security analyst and somebody who's been, who's been looking both at US policy towards South Asia, particularly from the time of the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan in 1979 to where we are now. I think everything that you have mentioned has left many of us, frankly, bewildered, particularly the decision to give up on Bagram. That was something which I, as somebody who has been in uniform for 40 years, I was completely confounded saying that if you have such a large withdrawal that you are planning, why do you give up an asset like Bagram? And anyway, I don't want to take this discussion elsewhere, but we did an exit from Sri Lanka. You remember we had the Indian troops, the peacekeeping in Sri Lanka. And that, I thought, was also an exit that was done under fairly, I would say, difficult circumstances, but in a very orderly way. So I'm just saying this because many of us in uniform did sort of make this observation. But I want to reel back to your you know, point about being the controller in the Bush administration and subsequently the audit that you had carried out. Two trillion dollars is a lot of money. It's almost 60% of India's GDP. 
So the query that everyone's asking, even if it was over 20 years, what is your assessment? Two things here. I'm not talking so much about numbers, about how much money was siphoned off and by whom. But this is about leadership, about the policy team that you had in Washington. Donald Rumsfeld was the defense secretary. And you know we know his profile in Washington and how the media loved him and all of that. But why was this corruption in a way? I mean, it's a Nelson's eye. That's the term I have used very often. Everybody knew, but nobody knew, if you know what I mean. So why did this happen? And what is your assessment personally? No? Well, um, the, I didn't actually do an audit. I was on a commission appointed by the Congress. Okay. This was uh, about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm to look at waste in Afghanistan and also in Iraq. And I'll get to your point about Donald Rumsfeld momentarily. So 10 years ago, we already found that between Afghanistan and Iraq, we had wasted up to $60 billion. That's My 10 God. years ago. Now, why did that happen? It happened because the government was not watching the contractors as carefully as it should have. There was a major implication 10 years later because of that. The contractors were still supporting both the uh, Afghan security forces in general and the Air Force in particular. Ask yourself, why did they still need contractors after 20 years? These people were not stupid. No one will call Afghan. Anybody who knows Afghanistan and Afghans knows that they are not stupid. Far from it. So why was the Afghan Air Force unable to operate on its own and keep the Taliban at bay? And my, re my view is because the contractors were never pushed by the government to hand over maintenance and support to the Afghans. In other words, to truly train them. They could not operate on their own because they never were really trained. And the reason was the contractors had every incentive to keep making money. Yeah, yeah. So basically saw, everyone had a stake in this to keep it going in this way. Exactly. And I saw this when I was on the commission. So I saw this already 10 years ago. And nothing was done about it. The government was not on top of the contractors back. It's not the contractors fault. When the government says to the contractors, you must jump, the contractors always say, how high? Yeah, yeah. That's not the issue. The issue is government supervision. And our commission made a series of recommendations to the Defense Department, most of which were ignored. So would this be on the Obama watch when you did this particular report? When we did the report 10 years ago, we already identified $60 billion in waste. But this was President Obama's tenure, right? No, this was, yes, this was in President Obama's tenure and, and very important here, in roughly the same time, the administration, Obama administration made a conscious decision to ignore corruption and focus on nation building. And uh, Why we I'm can flagging this nation that, building later on. Yeah, but I'm saying I'm only flagging this for one reason, that when we say Obama watch, Obama team was... Mr. Obama and Mr. Biden, but let me leave That's it correct. For, for there. I just want to, again, move to another area, which is that- Well, Biden Obama, wanted to get out. Yeah, I remember which, that. Uh, which, of course, uh, I'm not sure was correct either. But, but yes, this was on their watch. I just want to go to another area, which is that, you know, I am sharing this with you. On my visit to Afghanistan, to Kabul, many years ago, you know, this was the expression that I heard both from the local Afghans whom I had met, as also from some of the NATO personnel which is, you know, when we were talking about what is happening and, you know, my own interest in the region. I remember one of the diplomats, they saying that off the record, that listen, this is a huge gravy train. And he was talking about everyone, the United States, the NATO, the Europeans, and all the NGOs, the UN. And he said, nobody wants to get off. And that's a very sad, I would say, kind of observation. Of course, it was off the record, so one didn't want to talk too much about it. But I think this is a big issue that you have flagged. I want to move to another area, Doug, which is that now that the United States has left Afghanistan in this manner, there was a lot of talk about US credibility, the profile, and the fact that it has been dented, diminished at the US and its allies. But sitting in Washington, DC, particularly you track the hill, 
you know Europe very well. Japan now as East Asia, China, Taiwan, all of that. So to the extent that you can, can you just talk about geopolitics? You know, United States and the major powers and how is this playing out? Well, there, there's no question that uh, there's a lot of doubt. I know, for instance, in India, there's a lot of anger because India, I was actually helping India when I was comptroller in terms of getting those first two consulates in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of anger in, uh, in India. There's a lot of uh, unease in the Middle East. The Israelis and the Gulf Arabs in particular worry very much whether the United States can be relied upon. They know that there's a negotiation going on with the Iranians. They're not happy about that. And they're simply worried whether if there really was a crisis, the United States would still be there. The Europeans are now saying, you know, we really need to do more on our own. Mm -hmm. and no one is walking away from the United States. No one. Why should they? But no, they're I mean, nervous. The Chinese, the Chinese are asking you to do more in Afghanistan. That's well, <laughs> the Chinese, look, the Chinese are very, very clever. Four weeks ago, I guess it was, they had the Pakistani foreign minister and the Taliban in China. Now, what was going on there? Clearly, the Chinese were tilting more and more to the Taliban, anticipating the Taliban taking over. And they're interested in, economic, in two things, economics and making sure that the, the, Turkmenistan, the East Turkmenistan uh, terrorists don't operate from Afghanistan because they're concerned about the Uyghurs. Okay. On the other hand, they worry that in the absence of the United States, the place will become totally chaotic. If it becomes chaotic, then they have a terrorism problem coming from Afghanistan because there's no control. So they, of course, would like us having just been thrown out and having they, they were throwing parties to celebrate us being thrown out, but they want us there uh -huh. to suit their interests. Okay, that, that's how China operates. The problem, the fundamental problem is that we have to restore our credibility. And it'll take time. One thing we could do is spend more money. We have a thing called the Pacific Deterrence Initiative and the European Deterrence Initiative. And these are programs, on the one hand, in, in the Pacific to, to essentially tell the Chinese, don't go too far. And on the other hand, to tell the Russians the same thing. Uh -huh. We need to put more money in those initiatives. If Europe and, the, and our Pacific friends and allies see that we're doing that, that will enhance our credibility. We haven't done it yet as much as we should have, but we still could, of course. Okay, here's one question, which of course is now being you know, raised in many circles, which is the US-Taiwan relationship, particularly in a post-Afghanistan context. And we have seen statements coming out of Beijing, statements coming out of Taipei, and reverberations that one has seen in East Asia, particularly as far as Japan and South Korea are concerned. That will the balloon go up on Taiwan? That's number one. And if so, you know, what is the likely U.S. response in the current context? No? Well, uh, I don't think the balloon will go up because I don't think Beijing feels it can do it yet. Um, you know, as you know well, but India is a similar civilization. You go back thousands upon thousands of years. Time is looked at very differently in ancient civilizations than it is in the United States. In our country, if you go to a place that's 100 years old, that's considered ancient. Yep. <laughs> so we have, a very different we have a different perspective in that regard. And the Chinese know they have time, or at least think they have some time. Right now, I think it would be very, very awkward for them to do it. Uh, we still have tremendous capability at present. Uh, we've also uh, approved sales to Taiwan that had been pending for many years. But of course, Taipei will be nervous. Why shouldn't they be? If we let down a country that I remember, Hillary Clinton said, we'll never leave you. So this is a country that we told them we would not leave them, and we had troops there. We don't have troops in Taiwan. We have a much more complicated relationship with Taiwan. So if I was sitting in Taipei, I'd be very nervous. 
Now, one thing the Taiwanese need to do, they've started to do what they need to do more, is to focus on the kinds of capabilities that really would make life very difficult for a Chinese invasion. Instead of just buying some toys, which they've had a habit of doing, very fancy, expensive equipment that isn't really relevant to their defenses. They need, they're beginning to realize that that's not the way to go. Uh -huh. So on the one hand, I think China's not going to rush. Uh -huh. On the other hand, I think Taiwan is recognizing it needs to be very different about how it spends money on defense. But then again, they're nervous and we need to continue to reassure them and to continue to supply them. This isn't a matter of kicking dust in China's face. Uh -huh. It's a matter of being reliable. We have these agreements with China that go back to the 1970s and the early 1980s. But within those agreements, the basic American promise to China is we would never support Taiwanese independence. Yeah. That's not what we're talking about. Yeah. We're talking about supporting Taiwan's ability to defend itself. That's very different. You know, the area which I'm sure planners in America and think tanks are looking at, and we've said this in the past in our own bilaterals, which is that technology is pointing to a new kind of domain for both punctuation as also, I think, for getting the asymmetry in your favor, which is the maritime space cyber spectrum. That, to my mind, is the extended kind of area where these, these will play out. And I think Taiwan has a certain advantage, but hopefully they will go. But in the interest of time, Dav, I'm going to bring you back to one area that you had flagged also, which is that when we talk about the region, Afghanistan and AFPAC, you know, which was the term that's been used for many years, you spoke about the US decision to get into Iraq. Now, many of us, when it happened and subsequently, we said this is the biggest policy blunder, I'm using a strong word, in terms of how we saw it from the outside. Now, you spoke about US credibility. I want to push this further and say that apart from credibility, I think the US profile also was diminished in terms of integrity. When we had then Secretary of State Colin Powell making that presentation to the UNSC, and the narrative that the way the US projected it to the global community was, here you have a country in Iraq led by this irrational leader, Saddam Hussein, General Saddam Hussein. He is pursuing WMD, nuclear weapons, and he's also stoking Islamic radicalism. So that was the broad tripod under which the United States decided to attack Iraq. Now, years later, very soon after, I would say that it was found to be invalid. But by that time, it was too late. Everybody about everybody knew that if you spoke about a country that had nuclear weapons and was supporting jihadi terrorism and had a leadership that was completely, you know, under the jackpot of the army, it was Pakistan. And I know of a number of US academics, analysts who contributed, subscribed to this. But yet the United States just refused, despite the fact that you were losing your troops. I mean, look at this irony. You've been controller. U.S. taxpayers' money being diverted to Pakistan, Pakistan using that to aid the Taliban, to aid the Haqqani and kill U.S. soldiers. And then you also have incidents like Daniel Pearl. I mean, all of this is out there. But how do you see this? Will there be a correction now or will it be more of the same? Da? Well, first, let me start with Iraq. Virtually every Western intelligence organization believed initially that he had weapons, of, that he had a program for weapons of mass destruction. Everybody believed it. That wasn't really the issue because the, the inspectors, now he kicked out the inspectors, but we could have pushed for them to come back in. The issue really was the timing. Ha, had we given this question of Iraq more time, two things would have happened. One, we would have been serious, much more serious about Afghanistan. But secondly, we would have discovered that he didn't have a program. His own military was telling him he had one because they were scared of him. Why did we go in 2003? My personal opinion, for what it's worth, is because the people who wanted it most were afraid that Bush would not win in 2004 because he had a barely won in 2000. And so they were, they figured 2004, he couldn't do anything. It was an election year. The last thing you do is go to war in an election year if you can avoid it. 
So it had to be 2003. My personal opinion, that's why we went in that time. Now, in the case of Pakistan, yes, we know they're a nuclear power. We know that they support terrorism. So your question seems on the surface to be quite valid. However, a couple of things. First, I will admit, I was the one who started the program to help the Afghan uh, military, uh, excuse me, the Pakistani military at the beginning of our war in Afghanistan. Why? Because we want, and they did it at first. They did move troops away from the Indian border uh -huh. to, to be helpful on Afghanistan. The problem was, I know that when I was there, we had three different sets of checks and balances to be sure that they were doing what they were telling us they were doing. And we didn't give them all the money they wanted. Uh -huh. If they were playing games, they just got less money. That over time dissipated. So we just kept on giving them money. And that's what you're talking about, where they just got money and who knows where it went. Uh -huh. I think that to, if you believe that it was a mistake to attack Iraq, then it's certainly a mistake to attack Pakistan. Uh -huh. We're not going to attack Pakistan. The real question is, is there a way to pressure these guys? We've tried sanctions. They don't not necessarily work. A former prime minister of Pakistan, who happens to be a friend of mine, said to me, the difference between you Americans and the Chinese is that they are all weather friends. You're not. Mm -hmm. So we don't have all that much credibility with those guys. The ones who do are the Chinese. And I don't think the international community is pushing the Chinese hard enough to pressure the Pakistanis to get to, to start behaving. That's, the, that's your pressure point. And just like China lets Kim Jong-un off the hook uh -huh. in North Korea, they've been letting the Pakistanis off. On the contrary, not only are they letting the Pakistanis off the hook, they're continuing to support them in all weather, as my friend said. You know, I think this is really the kind of uh, contradiction that we are likely to see in the next few years when it comes to Afghanistan, when it comes to AFPAC, and when it comes to AFPAC China. Because what we, at least some of us are, the linkages that we are noticing here is that the Haqqani group is very, very dominant in terms of how the Taliban is going to orient itself, at least as far as India is concerned, as also the Al-Qaeda, which recently made a statement about Kashmir amongst other parts of the world. So we have a situation where the Haqqani is the face of the Taliban. The Taliban is supported by Pakistan and the deep state in Pakistan. And the deep state in Pakistan has the support of Beijing. So the contradiction really is that Beijing has its own concerns about terrorism and is hoping and expecting that Pakistan will provide the necessary buffer to ensure that China's interests are not affected. But this is like a replay of the United States and why the United States brought Pakistan on board in 2003-04 when Afghanistan, Iraq started. And again, the irony and the contradiction is that the Al-Qaeda is back. They are now making statements. And the Daesh, the Islamic State Khorasan, is making its own grand statements. So 20 years later, all I'm saying as an analyst sitting in Delhi is that the scourge of terrorism, particularly its jihadi area, seems to be now surfacing in ways that we had not expected in the period 2003 to 5, 6, when the global war on terror was uh, gaining momentum. No? Last there's a, yeah, there's a big difference uh, between uh, where we were and where China is. The difference is this. First of all, we were far away. True. Second of all, most of the terrorist targets are the West and the United States. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have a group that's anti-China. That's one group. But Haqqani is anti-us, ISIS is anti-us, Al-Qaeda is anti-us. They also happen to be anti-you. Yeah, yeah. And so China's a lot closer. It's an Afghan neighbor. It's a PAC neighbor. They, we don't have the leverage over Pakistan that China does. True. And China, I think, working with Pakistan and working with the Taliban could keep the uh, the the, the Uyghur terrorists under control. That's all they have to focus on, just them. They don't care if Al-Qaeda attacks us. 
-hmm. or if ISIS attacks us, or for that matter, if you get attacked. Yeah, yeah. So again, as I as I say, there's a huge difference between American leverage, even over the last 20 years, and Chinese leverage. Sure. Because over the last 20 years, Haqqani was operating out of out of Pakistan, mm -hmm. as were the Taliban. So it's different. And that's why I say the international community, if it really was serious about new, the spread of nuclear weapons, the spread of terrorism, would focus on China. And we know that there are good reasons why the Europeans in particular don't want to do that. But to me, that is the focal point. And Beijing has been very, very clever in evading that and avoiding that. And we are the ones who suffer. You suffer, we suffer, and actually Europe suffers too. Yeah, yeah. I think all the democracies, and this is a point that Prime Minister Narendra Modi has been making repeatedly whenever the issue of terrorism has come up. But on that note, uh, Dov, I just want to leave this last statement. You can respond if you wish to. If not, I'll let this go. Just as the US had a commission after 9-11, is the exit from Afghanistan these 20 years, is it big enough for the United States to consider having the equivalent of a commission to see where did we go wrong and what is it that we could have done better? Is it likely? Uh, should there be one? Yes. Is it likely? I'm not sure. One of the reasons is we have a bitterly divided Congress. There's already a major fight over a commission that it's not really a commission. It's, it's uh, the, the Democrats with some Republicans have put together a special uh, investigation of the January 6th insurrection, which of course pits most right. Republicans against most Democrats. So to overlay that with a, Another commission. a commission on this may be tough. Should it happen? Should it be uh, in organized? I personally think yes. We need, to, we need to see what lessons we can learn. Unfortunately, one of the things that we seem to continue to unlearn is that we are not really good at nation building. And the reason we're not is we don't understand foreign cultures and we think everybody wants to be like us. Lesson number one is not everybody wants to be like us. And that already would change the way we deal with other nations in the world. But that's a whole separate issue. Yeah, yeah. but I think this you know, really sums it up when you talk about the commission and other things. There are many things I think for the United States that are desirable, but they're very unlikely given the larger context. And I think one could apply the same observation to Afghanistan in the next few years that we are all hoping there are many things which are desirable, but they are unlikely to happen. But on that note, Dov, let me not, as I said, Dov, take you to another area. You have a deep water table and I know your constraints on time, but I hope we can invite you again to security analysis to share your thoughts. But for now, many thanks. And uh, we hope that Afghanistan and its people have a better future than what all the indicators currently suggest. I hope so as well. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you for watching Security Analysis. And we'll be back very soon with another topic. Jai Hind.